What's up, everybody? Welcome to We Have Cool Friends, the cool show where we interview our cool friends about the cool things they're doing. I'm Greg, this is Andrea, and that's our cool friend, Luke Smith. Yay! Yay! And you're into it, just like that. Yeah, I'm, and there we go. Oh, yeah. there we go. Bring All that right. energy up, you know what I'm talking about? I hope You should have had the donut. The donut or the coffee. Yeah, really. you're just, just pass it on both. I'm, you know? I'm leaning down before the product launch. Oh, oh okay. Balloon up, and now you start to lean, you know, for me, it's lean down. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> Leaning down. Yeah, yeah, you, you look better. <laughs> you know what I mean? I have looked better. Yeah, 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 exactly. That's how we all, I think, you and me both look all the time. Yeah, like, just, people, yeah, oh, you're looking better. Yeah, yeah, thank yeah, you. Not good yet. <laughs> Not good. I haven't hit that quota. Looking okay, better. Uh, okay. Luke, of course, you're... From Bungie. You work on a game called Destiny 2. I have. What's your title there nowadays? Oh, gosh. Uh, I think it's just Game Director, something like that. Because you're like the voice. You're, you talk about it all the time now, you know what I mean? Uh, we've tried some stuff recently that's led to some more communication mm -hmm. uh, this summer. We'll, we, we've, uh, you know, we have our own voice now, and so we've, we've tried to leverage that a little bit more. Uh, so, you wrote a manifesto. I loved it. It was, uh, I think pejoratively referred to internally as a screed. Uh, <laughs> some, some folks refer to it as a manifesto. I think Noseworthy, who's next to me at, at, uh, at the office, was like, I think that's a, how's your screed coming? Did, when like, you wrote it, when you wrote the director's cut, were you, did you walk in like Jerry Maguire? You're like, I got it, nailed it. No, uh, I, uh, I actually, uh, I didn't realize what it was going to become. Yeah, because we had the. I think there was something around the like, hey, we're gonna we're we're shelving shadow shadow keep needs a little extra time. And I was like, oh, I'll just like, I'll throw a little something out there, like an extra com or something. It'll be you know no big deal. Do like four thousand words, call it good. Uh, that's not what happened. Uh, it became that giant twenty two page long thing. I think when, uh, yeah, uh, that was not that was not the the. I did not think it was gonna be that long. That was a lot of. That was longer than any paper I wrote in college. Uh, and college was you so. You cared long more ago. about this. <laughs> I, did, I did actually. Yeah, way more that? than Bleak House yeah. or whatever. Right? Like yeah, that, that Dickens. Dickens uh, lit. As you both know, we have a show here called We Have Cool Friends. It's available all over the place. Podcast, iTunes. One of the one of the fee key components of it is the friend zone. And I usually like to keep the kind of funny best friends trapped in the friend zone, only let them out at the end of the show. But we've stumbled upon one. I want to let Colton out right now. Colton wrote into patreon.com slash kind of funny games, just like you can. Oh, no, this is kind of funny, right? But it's games related. This is a big one. You're the first time we've ever had a game person on We Have Cool Friends. So I hope you got to bring wow. the heat, all right? Uh, Colton says, the director's cut you posted recently isn't common tradition in the games industry. What do you think, or I'm sorry, why do you think that is? And why did you feel this was so important? Thanks for all you do, Colton. Uh, I think the why is it that way is just the, like, the way communication's changing. Like, yeah. it's like communication has actually gotten shorter and shorter and shorter, and the tastes get hotter and hotter. And it's like, how, how quickly can you summarize a thing and you know, either champion it or challenge it in you know, 140 characters or less? And so with the director's cut, I wanted to go back to kind of where I felt like I got a bunch of my inspiration from a long time ago. And so it was these longer form communications from developers or like or, you know, rants back in the day or whatever. And, <laughs> and, and think of it really like uh, an open, honest communication that doesn't have anything like a TLDR in it. There's no like f bullet points. Like at work, my emails are almost always just like short, crisp bullet points for expedience. But this, we wanted this to be something bigger that then people could read into and, and draw their own conclusions from and just be honest and tell people, hey, here's how we're thinking about this. Here's some stuff we've done. Here's things we're going to learn from and, and kind of project, you know, where we're going to go. Was everyone on board with that? Uh, I, th I think there was really good. Uh, I mean, I had a ton of help. Like yeah. the, 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 I mean, the Bungie team and like all the folks working on the, the game day to day. Like, you know, I went to someone like Lars Bach and, and said, hey, let's talk about Reckoning. You know, what did we learn? What are we learning? Yeah. And so I can, because I want to weave this into it. Uh, there were folks who said, some some folks in in my near area were like, really? It's, uh, <laughs> it's going to be how long? How long's the first one? <laughs> You're only doing two parts, right? And it's like, yeah, I think I'm doing two parts. And then the second part became the third part. And it's, you know, however long it ended up being. Uh, but I think afterwards, uh, I, I think people saw some some value in it. Although the strategy was, was different. Uh, uh, than, than we've used in the past. Well, that kind of transparency is so rare mm -hmm. from l large video game developers. Really, even indie developers sometimes don't have that much transparency with their audience. And for a group like Destiny players who have been following the game you know, since 2014 and really wanting to get peek inside what you guys have been thinking and kind of why you made some of the decisions you did, I think it was something that at least all of the people in my clan were incredibly excited to read and walked away from that going like, wow, this is super cool. I hope they do more of this. 
Yeah, I think that I hope that we do more of it too, but it's gonna be at a longer cadence. Like, yeah. like, no, like, I can't do that uh, once a month. Like, yeah. really, that would be uh, the amount of time it took. Was, Just come was, back to game journalism; it'll be great. I, you know, <laughs> I, th- I think there are parts of that, like the you know, I, I, I think all the time about podcasting. I think it's super fun. It's like one sure. of the with the. You know, I don't think it holds up. I don't think some of our work holds up super well twelve years later or whatever. But uh, times was, have changed. It, yeah, it's a little different. Yeah. but it was still so much fun. And so, uh, you know, I just heard you talking about Weekend Confirmed, and I was like, oh shit, I haven't, I haven't talked to Garnet in a while. He, li- he lives like adjacent to me uh, across the bridge. I should, I should catch up with him. Yeah, he's great. Oh, Weekend Confirmed. Shout out. Remember that to Garnet Lee, and Jeff Kanata. We're gonna take. A walk down memory lane with Luke Smith because this is We Have Cool Friends. We bring our friends here each and every week to talk about the cool stuff they're doing, the cool places they've been, the cool things they've accomplished in their life. If you like that, you should be part of the show. Patreon.com slash kind of funny. You can go there, submit questions for the cool friends. You can get the show ad free. You can support us like Patreon producers Al Tribesman and David Mindtel. Mind freak. Mind freak. Mind freak. (laughs) <laughs> Sorry, thank you very much, Barrett. I appreciate you jumping on the mic to give me a secondary mind freak. Uh, and of course, we have our sponsors, MeUndies, Zebit, and Upstart, but I'll tell you about them later. Luke, it's that thing. I think the one thing I've learned on this show is that people really enjoy uh, the nutshell. Right now, how would you describe yourself as somebody who's listening to the show and doesn't know you? Oh, boy. Uh, I re- I'm the game director for a game called Destiny, mm-hmm. uh, and it's a game that uh, has been... It's been around now for five years. Five years as yeah, of today. Five years, and uh, it's it's brought to you by Bungie, the makers <laughs> of a bunch of cool stuff. And uh, uh, you know, I just I, I'm lucky enough to get to talk about it. Yeah. In the build up to like, it's funny because we, you and I have been talking about doing this forever. We've yeah, been we, DMing well, about trying to podcast forever. Yes, we uh, and it, it all it all started in 2017 actually. Uh, you DM'd me in November of 2017. No, when I was playing. The yeah. only time Greg was a Destiny 2 player. Yeah, and it was, hey, it was actually I it. it was actually in a in a in a dark time for the rebellion. Like November of, oh. of 2017 was really it was a it was a dark period for Destiny. You know, people were frustrated with a bunch of the choices that we made on D2. And I've talked about this before, so I won't like belabor it. But but Greg, you actually sent me a DM that was like, "Hey man, uh, I know there's a lot of negativity out there. I'm like paraphrasing, but I just want you to know I think the game's really cool and I'm you know hang in there." And it, I was like. I never talked to Greg Miller before, and I just got this like shout out of the blue. I was like, "Oh my gosh!" Like, wow, it was, like, it was really touching, uh, and that kind of set off like a two-year-long DM cycle that ended up with us here today. A slow burn <laughs> yeah. to get here. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, t- to that point, I mean, you guys deserved it. I really enjoyed Destiny Two at launch, and I know so many, uh, a lot of people did too. And obviously, people continue to play it now, and a whole bunch of different stuff. Are, is there criticism? Is there critiques and all these different things? Yeah, and like, totally. what, what a player who has not stopped playing. Andrea wants out of it versus a player who is Greg Miller who is like, I planned it, all right, on to the next thing. You know, I want, of course there are. Yeah. yeah. But I think, you know, it's something that we, Andrea and I, know so well. And I know you do from a different time period of games journalism. But yep. like, the people who, the, the, it's a vocal minority that talks, period, whether it be positive or negative. And so when it is negative, it can seem like the whole world is hating this thing. When in reality, Millions of people are probably playing it, enjoying it, and not thinking that uh, you know they need to sign on and do something. They're thinking about, oh, I've signed off. I need to go to the groceries. I need to go take care of the kid. I don't need to write into Luke Smith on Twitter and be like, hey, great job, everybody. <laughs> or, hey, Luke, you know, and then insert anything that you want to insert. Like, yeah. <laughs> I just yeah. had something I want to share with you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. I don't know if you thought about this. Yeah. This is the one. It is. I like those. I like the. I don't know if you thought about this. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because because you know, have you I'll, often not thought about it? Oh, sometimes, yeah, for yeah. sure. Like, and sometimes it's you're like, oh, that's a really good idea. I wish I thought of that. Do you have a specific story that you can recall? I know I'm kind of putting you on the spot here. Uh, for a, I wish I thought of that. Yeah. Uh, I think at some point someone suggested uh, a particular World of Warcraft fight that they thought would translate really well into a Destiny raid. And I, I probably remember thinking, God, I wish I thought of that. That's a good one. The mechanics would, the mechanics would translate really well to the action game. Yeah. It's not too late. You guys are going to make another raid at some point. We actually, yeah, there's there's one coming out this fall. Yeah, we're going to keep making raids. People nice. like them. Destiny raids, man. You remember the first time we raided together? I do. I loved it. I, I, that was the thing. of I, I Honestly, as somebody who 
doesn't or i guess at the time get games of service wasn't playing them that much right like my rating experience was dc universe online which i had put so much time into but even then i was always being sherpa right like somebody was always taking me on doing stuff so when destiny 2 uh, the first raid dropped and we were jumping into it i remember that thing of finishing that first night and walking into the bedroom and jen jen woke up she's like how was it i'm like we played for six hours and we lost and it was great <laughs> i had so much fun like it was so much fun yeah it takes a special kind of masochist. <laughs> it does. It does. Yeah. The we talk a lot about internally. We talk a lot about that feeling of you know like the losing is actually kind of like the glue that's binding people together and like creating those creating a bunch of the relationships that you know we think are really important in a game like Destiny. Well, there's always the little incremental like, okay, wait, you, mm -hmm. I'm doing more damage against these people. You guys should use this weapon. You come to me in the shadow realm or whatever. We had to shoot those goddamn skulls. Oh god. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, you, you don't know God me. All oh, right? the futileness of like one person doing one little thing wrong and everybody yep, had to do me. it so perfectly. Okay. The stress I felt I felt in the uh, first part of it of running and jumping through the circles and, mm -hmm. and calling them out and stuff like. I remember, like, I was good at it, and I never, fu I never fucked it up. But in I was the always gauntlet, terrified. You're talking about. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. was always terrified that I was going to get in there and screw it up. Never did though. So powered me. But for uh, <laughs> in terms of today, right? Uh, because where I was originally driving is we've been talking for years about coming on the podcast. We finally booked this date. Great. You tweet this morning. Hey, it's the fifth anniversary of Destiny. <laughs> it's kind of a life changing thing. And I was like, oh, it's almost like we planned it when we did not plan it. Uh, actually, so v Vanessa, who's who's our PR director, over there, is sitting over here very quietly. Shout out to for Vanessa. Years. She pointed. She used to work on Marvel video games a lot. I remember that. Yeah, those were the days. She yeah. she pointed out when we booked this that it was on the anniversary, but I totally forgot. True story. Until this morning, and it's like, you know, six forty five, and we're at the airport, and I'm like, oh, looking at my mentions, and someone's like, oh, it's Destiny, and I'm like. Oh shit! Is it? Because you have to like you have to double check everything on the sure. internet, right? You're of like, course. Maybe it's someone. Maybe they're like in Europe and it's really nine ten. So I look it up. And I'm like, oh, it's nine nine. I was like, oh shit! I should probably say something. And then and I was like, oh yeah, this is kind of perfect. Yeah. So. So I was gonna. The question I was leading to <laughs> is like for the last five minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Why? Well, you know, welcome to kind of funny. Uh, it was this on your guys's radar as a studio? Had you talked about it? Like I feel like, especially now. Your newfound independence, you're continuing to work on this game. You have so many ideas for where it's going. It's one constant release. It's not like you have you ship it and you walk away from it. Do you have time to sit there and go, oh man, five years. Everybody gather around with your champagne glasses and a cake. We're not very good at that. Yeah. Like as a as a company, uh, one of the things that we, we struggle with at Bungie is like celebrating. Like we'll 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 like have a launch event and things like that. But the like the culture of like celebrating or like looking back and being like, ah, oh, that thing we did is really good. That is just culturally not how we look at game. I, I like. I, I wish we did. People, we would be happier if we did. But it's so often about looking ahead, or like we're like sharks. We have to keep swimming. And so, like, what's the next thing we're gonna do? Okay, you know, last, last like two weeks ago or last week, we were like planning the next few seasons, getting those through concept, and then we have another thing that we're working on. And so you're kind of just always looking ahead. And while while like our fans and Destiny players, are like, oh, Shadow keeps coming out. It's it's awesome. Can't wait. And we're like, oh, but season ten, you know, we're like onto the like onto the next thing, you know. Yeah. Uh, well, you so got CJ on your team now. Make it his job. CJ, that is not CJ's job. <laughs> CJ, CJ's got plenty of plenty of important work to do beyond helping us pop the champagne. Thank God you hired him and not Fran. You know, I'm glad you, said, you, know, you made the right call. I mean, there. Fran would up the overall hair game of the studio well, just fair, upon fair. arrival. That's fair. That that's is, that's 100 he's true. a striking head of hair. Yeah. So do you think about it as, man, it's been five years or has it been way longer for you? Uh, I think about it like, man, I'm I'm in year nine. Yeah, uh, basically. So I started working on Destiny in 2010, right after uh, Halo Reach shipped. And so I'm in my ninth year, heading on 10. And then the way I really think about it, uh, to just bum everyone out, is that's almost a quarter of my life. So next year I'll hit year 10 and I'll turn 40. And I'm like, oh, it's 25% of my life. How do I feel about that? Like, how do you feel about it? And you're like, ah, oh, you get, you can get really reflective about it. How do you it. feel about it? So um, this is, so we've had like, you know, as we have people like come and go in the company, there's like one thing I do with almost all the, at least from folks from the design team try to do before they go, which is talk to them about, would you put it on your tombstone? And so oh. I really do think about the work that, I, and this I'm only speaking as Luke, not not Bungie at all, just just me as a human. I, I really do think about the type of work that I do uh, in my life as if I died, would I be excited to put this on my tombstone? And so, you know, things like, you know, husband, father would be there. Scarab Lord from World of Warcraft would be there. Sure. And I think, you know, brought the raids to the first person shooter would be there. And so when people are leaving to go to a new company or take a new opportunity, I always want to talk to them about like, I just want you to go somewhere where you can put something on your tombstone, because uh, that's really about purpose. And I like 
So uh, when I think about the like, okay, it's a quarter of my life. I'm like, ah, yeah, but there's some pretty cool shit in there. There's some stuff I'm like really proud of getting to be a part of. And there's not a lot of folks that I've met in the game industry who who work on something and then are excited to go home and fucking play it. Yeah. Right? And so I still play, I still play the game all the time. I mean, like right now I'm just chilling a little bit before Shadow Keep comes out. You know, I'm playing a little WoW Classic because Solstice turned off and I only completed one set of armor and I wrapped up the, t- the title. Of course. And so I was like, all right. Dork. I can, yep. I can just, there's some games in, there's, <laughs> yeah, there's some games in September that I want to check out. Oh, shit. Now I'm playing this 15 year old WoW Classic game. But it's well, like, you and hundreds of thousands of other people. So. Yeah. And, and it's not just waiting in the queues. You know, we're getting in. We're playing. We're leveling. <laughs> so. I always like to go back with these shows. Where does this all start? Because I feel like we've talked about it very briefly there with We Can Confirm and One Up and all that stuff. But like, you used to be one of us. But that feels like a lifetime ago for <laughs> us, let alone you. It does feel like a lifetime. So like, ago. how? Wh- uh, where does it start that you want to get into games? Period. Uh, I th- so I'll just say where it started with games first. Like yeah. my parents were not. Uh, my parents were not interested in me having video games as a kid. Uh, it was a uphill climb, and I think when we were. Maybe nine years old, uh, they finally let us get a Nintendo Entertainment System, uh, and then they played it. Like the first, like the first night we had it, my parents just played Mario, and then we had to go to bed. <laughs> and like just, I'm just that's an idea of where it all comes from. Uh, and then if you skip ahead, by the time by the time I got to college, you know, I was playing a bunch of sports games, and I was playing, uh, you know, I played a bunch of like JRPG games, but. People who were making video games, it was like an enigma to me. I didn't know anything about it. And it wasn't until 2004 so uh, where I was watching. I, I had got Metal Gear. I think it was Metal oh, yeah. Gear Solid 2 in 2004 and Halo 2. And I was playing them, playing through them both, you know, jumping back and forth through the campaigns. I finally finished Halo 2, and then I watched the Vidoc. Uh, it was like before it was called the Vidoc. There was this documentary, and it was a documentary about Bungie. And I still remember like what Jason, the company founder, was was wearing in the Vidoc, and he was talking about like at Bungie with these like cynical, twisted, jaded gamers. And if something doesn't capture our ten, our uh, our interest in ten minutes, you know, we turn it off. And I was like, oh my god, there are people like me, <laughs> <laughs> and they're doing this thing that I had no idea how to do right, like it's completely no clue. And were you th- just uh, how old are you here? Are you I'm aimless tw- in I'm terms? Twenty three. Of- okay. Twenty three. Twenty three. Twenty four years old, and so I am working at a Alt, or, or, tw- at this point, it is a twice weekly newspaper in Dearborn, Michigan, writing about arts and entertainment. Okay, uh, and that was my way of getting free copies of video games. Sure, uh, while also covering things like uh, the Red Hat Society of Dearborn or getting tased by the local police for a column that I was writing, and that was the type of stuff I was doing before I eventually worked at an alt weekly like the SF Weekly here, one, yeah. one in one in Detroit. Uh, I got fired from that job. What for? I got fired because I was using company email to get another job. Wow, yeah, that's bad. That's yeah. bad. Yeah. Don't they do that. They can read your emails on yeah, the company can. email so server. That was, yeah, yeah. I didn't. Yeah, it was, and I was, and then that job was Kotaku. Oh, and so I worked at Kotaku a long time ago before the bylines were signed, and then left that job after about a year to go to One Up. Wow. And then that's you know, it's kind of where it, that was the la- that was the the end, that was the stopping point. Yeah. Why was stop it, there though? Yeah, what was the like thought of the transition? Because Greg and I know tons of people, and you do as well, that have made that jump from working on the media side to work for a, a developer or a publisher. Was there a specific thing that pushed you in that direction? Uh, yeah, I mean, I was living in the tenderloin. I had no money. I moved out here with <laughs> money's oh, a good one. I, 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 I moved out here with all of uh, eleven thousand dollars that I'd saved up from not paying my like taxes when I was working at Kotaku. Right? That won't blow up in your face. And it's all handled now. You know, I took care of it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, and and it was, yeah, it was it was like holy shit! I can't live like this. Like I actually, I actually cannot live like this. And we couldn't, you know, Ziff Davis and I couldn't find a way to to make it work. And uh, I had met folks from uh, a small company in Irvine called Blizzard, and I was gonna I, I was gonna go there and uh, talk to them about an opportunity on Battle.net. And then I knew Frankie and Brian, uh, Frank O'Connor and Brian Gerard, sure. who are who are over at Three Four Three now, and they were like, "You're you're gonna go to Bl- don't come to Bungie, come here." And uh, so I interviewed uh, for Bungie, came up and started off just kind of writing jokes for them. About a year into, so is that what you were hired as a writer? Yeah, you're punching I stuff. Just hired up? to like write stuff for the web, like a like Deej and our community folks. And back then, we just called it content editor, and we worked on the website. And about a year in, uh, we were working on Halo Reach, and the creative director for that game had a producer named Alan Murray, who now 
Alan, Alan, he works for a publisher. I think it's like Take Two via something called Private Division. Oh yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, Alan and Marcus Leto needed someone to think about reward systems for their game, and all people really knew about me was I liked Warcraft and I liked Halo. And Alan was like, "Could you think about some of this stuff?" And uh, so I started off uh, thinking about stuff for Halo Reach, and that became all the armor stuff, and the supply depot, and the point system, and commendations. And it all started from this conversation I had with the producer, who was just willing to give me a shot. And then it was it was start literally at the the bottom, like start at the the lowest level of the design ladder at, at Bungie, and make your way up, and learn from a bunch of super smart folks, and make a bunch of goofy mistakes along the way, and. Uh, Kind of like, you know, there's some like, there's some missed zero in the credit tuning for the original Halo Reach that I still feel bad about. <laughs> where it made like the, it made some rank way the fuck too long. And it was because I like fat fingered a zero or something. <laughs> you just have to like live with that forever because we didn't patch that game, right? We shipped yeah. it and we were done with it. And so uh, that was the, you know, that was the early design journey. And then, and then uh, I, I got, I, I, the first like early period destiny was really hard for a bunch of us because this is before it gets announced when it's just being worked on. Yeah. This is just when it's just being announced. It's what kind year of, are we at right now? We're in now we're in like 2010. Okay. Okay. Uh, that period of time, there's just a lot of, a, a, a lot of soul searching about what the game was going to be. And you mm-hmm. can see a bunch of that soul searching, like continue to kind of manifest over a destiny's journey. Right. And so around 2000, I want to say 11 or 12, I was really bored. And the, uh, why? Uh, so you're just like working in OneNote on like feature ideas and specs that you didn't feel like were ever going to ship. Gotcha. And you're like, oh, it's just like, I just want to work on stuff. Like making stuff in Halo Reach was so fun because we're like in there making stuff, working with engineers, and now we're just like writing documents all day. Like, eh. <laughs> and uh, Jones grabbed me because uh, he can hear it. I was, I was pretty unhappy. And he grabbed me and said, hey, we want you to take on this raid thing. Like uh, the raid, the designer who'd done the prototype for the, the raids had just left. I remember playing the prototype and be like, "This is pretty cool." I think you know. I think I, 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 like I'm interested in this. You know, the uh, mm, okay. Uh, this piques my interest. Yeah. Was that prototype? Did that ever make it into Destiny? Uh, the prototype did not. No, the uh, a mechanic from the prototype did show up in later period Destiny. Can you which let us that? know which What's mechanic that? that was? Yeah. So uh, in the original prototype, uh, there was a, a section where you carried a, a giant like heavily modified brute hammer basically because you're prototyping in, in a familiar engine across a bridge and so the bridge what I wanted to do with uh, Crota's End was make sure that there were some notes that were a callback to this like thing that we all came from you know that loving that raid prototype and so the the bridge and the bridge remaster were, all, were, were both like descendants from that original, original parentage uh, and then in 2011 or 12 I don't recall the year at this point we took on took on the raids and built the raid team and They've made a ton of awesome stuff, and that you know, there was, you know, originally I don't know if people know this. Um, Crota's End and King's Fall were um, one thing. Like they started off as like one mega concept that then we we had to like split and we had to shelve because the the end of the game was about the Vex and was, and I was like the the raid has to be about the Vex then too. So we had this big hive thing that we wanted to do. We we like paused that and then. Um, built this this whole new raid that originally the writing team wanted to call the glass throne mm. but that is uh, a toilet yeah the, that's like the, mm. that's, that feels very the porcelain, porcelain throne. it feels very <laughs> porcelain throne adjacent yeah, so it's like yeah, toilet yeah. toilet adjacent so i was like i think this throne lives up to its name it, oh, review yeah. on ign <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 you're like you could see the takes coming and so, so we had that we had that that triangle painting that one of our concept artists did of the of the the, the final space and i was like we're just going to call it vault of glass and that's that's going to be what, what we're going to do uh and, and that turned out that turned out pretty well and then uh, one of the one of the designers on the raid team came up with the the lamp lighting for Crota, and we were like, oh shit, we could just have this thing here. And w- that the end of Crota was originally the end of this like hive raid that we never made, like that like giant thing, the giant eye in the the distance or whatever, um, whatever that's called now. I think the Oversoul. And then the the opening room of King's Fall, not the jumping puzzle, but the opening like encounter. That was an original encounter space. Uh, that Brian Frank, uh, who's now the raid lead, and I did a long time ago, and then the ogre room uh, where you fought Fogoth was in a ra- like like they, like we redid all these rooms, but like the original skeletons came from this raid that we never used, and 
uh, there's always this like insecurity about talking about like, oh yeah, cut content or they like use this stuff up. But the reality of making games and generating ideas is a bunch of your stuff is going to be built on the bones of the ideas you didn't get to see through. And I remember, I remember the first time Jason said that to me, uh, I was, I was like, you're like, no way, man. You're wrong. <laughs> like, Watch uh, me. Yeah, I'm going to shock the world. I love new ideas all the time. But what happens is you end up like, you end up going back to those things that you didn't get to do and being like, why didn't that work? Like, I still want to do that. Let's do that. That's really cool. 100%. Really long story. No, I love it. That's, what, that's all this podcast is. <laughs> yeah. is a really it's a long story. It's, a long, it's the longest I've talked in a long time. <laughs> well, you write long too. Uh, the question, right. right, I have is you talked about the tombstone, right? Yeah. Husband, father, you know, brought the raid to the first person shooter. Scarab Lord. Scarab Lord. <laughs> Sorry, dork. <laughs> nothing on there about Kotaku. Nothing on there about one up. Like, do you, wh- how do you look back on your time in the media, right? Because uh, again, like Andrew said, you're one of the many who have uh, left yeah. the, uh, our nest to go do it. But like, for me, it's all I know. So yeah. like, it's uh, like IGN and now kind of funny, obviously, are such definitive parts of me. I think for a long time, I think that, I think my answer is for a long time, uh, after starting at Bungie, I, I was really insecure about the idea that I had come from media because really? I felt like I had not. You press sneak fuck. Yeah, I, well, like oh, I like snuck my way in here and like oh, I'm not as like talented or smart and I don't know how to do this stuff. Imposter and, syndrome. Yeah, complete imposter syndrome, and uh, I think it also was for a long time early in career uh, at at Bungie, I was like trying. I felt like I was trying to shed that. Like mm-hmm. I was trying to like mm-hmm. oh, like yeah, it's like no like. I'm I, like I was in a cocoon. I'm coming out. I'm I'm a designer butterfly now. You know? <laughs> Just love me for my new wings. Don't talk to me about what I used to be. And so there's a thing about that where you're like, oh, I'm trying to like no, only know this version. And I think you know that's like, I mean like late twenty. Like I'm like in my late twenties. Sure. Still, like I think you're still kind of forming in a bunch of ways. And I get in my early thirties. Now I'm like, you know, I'm like in my late thirties. Now I'm like a. I'm like a product that's finished. This is like it's just gonna be this. Yeah. It's gonna be it's Shit. gonna be this, but like older and like bigger. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and so that's kind of the and like less hairy. That's <laughs> that's like what's that's where it's going, right? So I think I've I've gotten more comfortable just in my in my skin in general, and like more comfortable just as a human being. That I think is just a part of getting older. Uh, and so now it's just like you know to me it's like sed- sedimentary layers that you know I I think about and you know. Uh, I don't know that a bunch of that work holds up. I, like I said earlier, I don't know that different times, time, man. Different time, very That's different. All the time, yeah, man, like, 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 people whew. don't get it. You know what I mean? When they're like, now, nah, like, oh my god, they're, like even if there's a joke of being paid for a review, but it's just like I mean to the point of I remember the first review I wrote at IGN, going over to Chris Roper and be like, all right, my review's finished. And he goes, all right, publish it. And I was like, does anyone read it? Does anyone copy it? He's like, not for, nah, not for this. Just go. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> 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 Like that's not how it works that, anymore. That's, right? that's not how the director Scott worked. <laughs> like, uh, Vanessa, could you read this again? I have a uh, draft seventeen. It's eighteen thousand words long. Could you? Wait, was that your job? <laughs> oh no! <laughs> Vanessa read. <laughs> Vanessa read director Scott more than anyone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> She's yeah. just over there laughing. Well, I think that's uh, a testament to how far you've come, right? I mean, from term getting there, imposter syndrome, right? Worrying about if you're actually going to be accepted. To now you are the voice of this game and you are the voice of this company on this front. Uh, I don't know. You still feel the imposter syndrome, right? Yeah. Like the, yeah, for sure. Like it's still, you know, that's, a, I think that's just a real thing about the way we're wired. Where, uh, I don't know. I, I got, I might be worried if someone didn't feel it. Cause it, cause like you can, you can always do better. Like you can always try to be better at the thing that you're doing. And I think that's part of where the imposter syndrome manifests is this like, ah, oh, like if I was better at this, I, maybe I wouldn't feel this way. And so it comes from this like innate, innate thing that we feel about like, Hey, we want to get better. We want to be better humans. We're like, there's a thing I'm not as good at as I could be, you know, how do I get better? And I think that maybe it's the cloud that creates it. Do you feel though that you're more confident in your position now? Cause I even think back to when I saw you on stage during the destiny Two reveal event and there were so many members of the media and, you know, content creators and everybody in the audience there. And you're going up on stage talking about this big fucking two, um, to where you were then, even just you know a couple of years ago to now, do you feel more confident and more comfortable? Uh, I think overall, probably a little bit more comfortable. The uh, that event was was really fun. Uh, the I will remember for the rest of my life a bunch of parts of that event. It was really cool, super memorable. Uh, but the uh, uh, I think I think as we've I think some of the the confidence or comfort mirrors getting more comfortable with what we're trying to do with Destiny. You know, like we are we are. We're figuring it out. 
you know, we're able to settle in on the vision for the game, what we want it to be, that like awesome action MMO, single evolving world that you can play anytime, anywhere with your friends. Like, I'm gonna keep saying it, because now, now we are trying to do the thing. And so with that, I think it's not just a confidence for me, it's like the team has a direction that we can all follow together. And I think that's, that's the thing that's, that's awesome. Was this, there this idea that MMO was like a dirty term to be used around Destiny? I know that the, the term was shared world shooter for a long time, but is there, was there like a reason you guys specifically wanted to embrace MMO now? I, th I think it was a couple things. Like it, it, sometimes if you hear the word MMO, yeah, certainly if you think back to 2000, you know, that early period, 2010, 11, you're really thinking about WoW. And if you're thinking about why, you're thinking about subscriptions. And if you're thinking about subscriptions, you're already already a bunch of players are like, yeah, it's like I'm out, like right. And so there's like a there's like a practical business side approach to how you want to talk about a thing that I think led to like, oh, let's like stay away from MMO. And I think I think another thing was you know, uh, uh, MMO games can sometimes not feel like a that crisp action game that we 100%. really want to make sure that we're delivering. And so you're like, ah, oh, well, what if you? How are those two things going to compete? And of course, now we're like, we're doing both, you know. But well, but now you've proven it, right? I yeah. mean, that's the thing. Five years now, people understand what Destiny is, how it plays, how it feels, how it is that. But I, I, I remember what you're talking about. Of, and I remember when, and I know I'm beating dead horse, but DC Universe come online coming to PS3, and it was so. How are you going to do an MMO on a console? What does that mean? Like yeah. it, it was. I remember their messaging of it being like, well, no, it is action. You are doing the moves and the thing. It isn't, you know, like click, 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 and it's happening. You're actually making something. But it, again, it was a different industry back then. I think people were so hung up on terms. Yeah. Remember, I was talking to somebody this weekend about video games, uh, obviously Borderlands stuff, and it was the idea of like, remember when you you played the first Borderlands and people were like, it's an RPG shooter. What does that mean? What do you mean? Like, and so they, true. Uh, we'd be re writing reviews and there's RPG elements in it. And like every game has R is an RPG now. Everything's a skill tree. Everything is added on. But that was a different thing at breaking out of that genre constriction. We've added RPG elements to life. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah, yeah, all exactly. kinds of things. You got, you got your rings on your phone systems. now yeah, as you walk exactly. around. Yeah, all yeah. sorts of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, how is the. When does the journey shift for you, I guess behind the scenes probably, where you know you're taking on even more? Like we're talking about how you got there, right? And you like started, you're just doing some dumb jokes, then you get to just working on a raid. When do, are they looking at you going like, hey, do you want to like direct to? Uh, so that the, uh, the, the next step after the raids, so we had, we had Vault of Glass and there was this period where it was, it was like December of 2013. Yeah, December of 2013. We had, we had Vault in good shape early where... In 2013, in, in December, we were uh, there was a play test before people went on holiday, uh, and and in my head, I didn't know how the raid was. I thought it was doing okay. I thought we were I thought we were okay, but uh, I wanted I wanted to I wanted folks to play at the studio to get to get some more more perspective, and uh, in my head, I was like, okay, well, if this isn't working by now, uh, then we should kill it, like because we shouldn't spend time on it in the new year, and the only part that wasn't working was the end and so mm -hmm. we, re we refactored the ending uh in the early part of the year and that meant that we could um move some of the team onto the next raid because we felt like well if we could do one i think we can understand the f the, the, the highest level formula uh and then start to do another one so then we booted up crota's end and we got crota's end uh up and moving and uh around that time it was spring of 2013 yeah, it was spring of 2013, and they came and asked me if I would be interested in taking on more work to work on the first expansion set that would come out in 2015. And that project, um, that project had a little bit of time. It had it had time, uh, but it was it was in a questionable state, um, as they always are, like every <laughs> single time. Uh, they're they're questionable until they're not, uh, and they're not arrives at different places for different projects, uh, and so. I, I said, yeah, I'll, I'll take that on. I remember, I remember being like, I'm not ready for this. Right? Like the, like, this is uh, super imposter syndrome. So yeah, like, you're like, ah, oh, God, how are we going to do this? And then that's when I got paired up with Noseworthy uh, and Noseworthy and I have been working together ever since. And um, we started working on Taken King and I would work on TTK during the day and I would work on Destiny 1 at night. And so uh, a few of us were staying Longer than usual hours <laughs> to uh, to play test and really look at the progression game for D1 while building up the learning base of how we would begin to evolve the game going mm. forward in, in Taken King. So even before even before D1 came out, we were already thinking about things like 
you know, three digit light and uh, infusion type mechanics and other things because we'd played so much during the summer before the game came out. But basically have the like, there's a little window there. We have kind of like two jobs going on. Um, but yeah, that was the that was the next step was now now doing an expansion. Like a full expansion set. Yeah. So what does a game director great game director do for people who are familiar with the title but don't really understand like what the role is? Like, what can would you say you do here? It's, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's a little. It's probably a little different in every company. So for us, the game director is the the is responsible for setting the vision for the the game, uh, the fr the franchise in our case with Destiny, uh, and also responsible for then like organizing and shepherding the different leads uh, for across the whole game. So we have like a systems director, art director, we'll, ha we'll have a new narrative director. You know, we have, we have uh, a team and it's about getting them all together to buy into the vision for the game and then driving the vision for the game across all the, all the, it's such a douchey way of saying it, but all the products, <laughs> you know, it's like, it's, it's, it's driving that vision throughout the year. So for instance, this year, uh, if it's, you know, one of the things we're trying to do is make it so all of our seasons feel connected. Like our seasons in Destiny in the past haven't felt connected. And so that's an example of the type of thing that I'm responsible for ensuring that happens. But really, sorry, I'm responsible for ensuring that we have a vision, that here's where we're, here's where we're trying to get, get to, and then helping marshal the team to make that happen. And so you're meeting with, you're in meetings all the time. You know, you, you, and then... That's you, fun. And then... Who doesn't uh, love a good meeting? You know, uh, I, I, a way it was described to me that I think is really good is it's like being the like admir um, admiral of a fleet where you're, you're not piloting any given ship. Uh, but what you're doing is you're saying, hey, here's where we're going to go. And then as we're building things, and you know, think of that as the movement of the fleet, they're checking in and being like, oh, yeah, you guys are, you're in the mark. Or like, oh, you, you're going over there. Oh, you found something better. Let's get the whole fleet to go where those folks are going. It's not just, oh, buy fiat. This is what I think we should do. It's like organic. And at, at a place like Bungie, it really is a, a hybrid of like, and you know the the meritocracy of ideas, and you know a little bit of vision to guide those initial ideas, and then like, okay, how do we pad this all into place to try to make it feel, you know, cohesive? You talk about all that and being the admiral. Why do you think it took you guys so long to get to? Here's the vision. Like you, you talked about earlier, right? Of like MMO, we're doing this thing. This is what it is. We're, we're off off on our way. So it's a it's a it's a true but totally unsexy answer. Like our organizational structure was different. Yeah. Like the like the actual way the company was set up was you know coming off of Taken King you had you had um, you know like Noseworthy and Smith and our leads and you know we've worked with the same art director for a long time and so you had like our like little pocket of folks and then there was another little pocket of folks another little pocket of folks and they all had different releases that they were working on and so that's really hard to create something that's like has continuity and cohesion and so this organizational change uh was a was a really important part of it yeah sure. uh, to, to getting to where we are we're we're heading today yeah yeah makes sense yeah it's it's not like about the ideas like any like we have a ton of folks who have incredible ideas far far better ideas than than i'm gonna have but it was about like we were we we haven't been in the place to like get all that out in front of us um, did you know that was the problem or did you not is it one of those things you didn't know till you knew because like you talk about like i remember when destiny 2 did launch yep. right and again i i enjoy i enjoyed it and, and played the hell out of it but there was the uh the player reaction from like the hardcore fan base it was like oh i want more of this less of that blah blah, blah to, uh, to this thing and, and the, i remember there being a, a rallying cry that i couldn't speak to obviously because i played destiny 1 to level cap but never done any, any stuff it was like how is it like this after destiny 1 yeah i think i think there you have this manifestation of the the, mul the multiple overlapping teams and overlapping releases yeah. would be the way I would like synthesize the pro that that like problem statement really cleanly. And so, you know, um, Destiny Two was a project that even Mark and I joined. You know, while that was uh, well under construction, and so you're like, okay, well, what do we got? Like, okay, but it's we weren't set up organizationally to say, well, what are the cool things that are happening? And even in Destiny, uh, Destiny One, Year Two or Three, and how do you leverage those things? You're like, oh yeah, like there's trade-offs that you're making as you're doing all of this and you're you know like oh we could have this feature in, in this executable but in destiny 2 we need this feature and up oh, we can't do that feature in this executable. blah 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 like it's just horrible it's like horrifying sure, right sure. and so this was one of the things that uh ultimately folks like um you know noseworthy and the production team felt like was a real problem and wanted to take on and i, I you know i totally you know, I, I totally of agree course. and now we're going to start to over time hopefully see that uh see the fruits of that and then here's the other thing we don't got it all figured out. You never got it all figured out. Like, what's uh, you know, if there's other landmines that we're gonna step in or whatever depth charges to really, <laughs> <laughs> oh, really stick, going with stick with the admiral and the fleet. Yeah, but the uh, you know that's gonna keep happening. And you know, you know, we're you know positioned to keep 
to keep iterating on this thing. And, you know, Destiny is, you know, as of the beginning of the year, it's like, you know, it's on us. It's now, just now, you guys now. Yeah. yeah, just, yeah. You know. Which is horrifying and also, I imagine, incredibly liberating. It's Yeah, it's got some pretty awesome some pretty awesome components to it. Uh, it is also, uh, I think it can also be really scary. You know, we have, we try to be really transparent with a bunch of stuff with the team. So we're watching, you know, daily active users and all this stuff. And it's just on screens when you walk through the studio. So you're like, ooh, uh, what's going on today? Uh, Tuesday looks bad or whatever. You're know, like, oh, like we're all looking at that data together just as a part of like, Going to get a Coke Zero. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you ever get too close to the data, though? Because I would imagine, you know, refreshing that those kind of numbers all the time can kind of give you a warped perspective of how active your community at large is. Yeah. So there's like if there's like a really slippery, dangerous slope that we talk about, which is we actually don't want to be data driven as a company. We want to be informed by data. Like it's like a it's a there's there's a bunch of things that make up how we look at the health of destiny. Uh, or maybe maybe people look at this for other games. I don't know. But the you know there's your your population. There's things like sentiment. There's it's like it's a whole picture, right? It's not just well it says that uh, 47 percent of players aren't playing Stripe. Not that's not good enough. But you're like. Oh look, people aren't talking. People are talking a lot about. I wish strikes were more used. I'm making this up, by the way. Of course. Uh, I wish people were talking about like, or people are talking about. Oh, strikes. This data point about strikes, and we're seeing that in player sentiment and scraping data and all word clouds and all this like sampling that we do. Oh shit! And the population is low for strikes. And you're like, hmm. Okay. Well, what do we need to do? And you're like, oh, let's dr- drill into the incentive structure. Like, oh, they don't want to play for two blues or whatever. Like that is real. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, that's true. <laughs> checks out. Yeah, yeah. It checks the, out. Uh, and so then. You start to think about like, okay, well, what are the changes we want to make, and then what's the behavior we're trying to create when you make those changes? Yeah, how do you, you think- not go mad? Like that sounds like way too. I I can't <laughs> imagine making a game. Period, Andrea. You know that I'm an idiot. But on top of making a game, making a game that is constantly evolving, constantly changing. You guys are in there making these switches. You're listening to this feedback. You're figuring out the engrams. It's year nine, man. I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. The madness may arrive. It may. Yeah. It, may it may be coming. It may. It may be. You know, just over the horizon or. You know, maybe not. It but. just seems like a lot to to juggle between the incredibly complex progression mechanics built into the world of Destiny, Destiny Two, balanced with this really deep lore system that you know some some of the fans have really dug into. And obviously, you guys released the Grimoire book, you know, earlier this year. You know, do you guys ever have these conversations, or maybe you know you come to blows in, in your team about what's going to be sacrificed, a mechanic or a lore <laughs> item? Yeah, uh, we talk a lot about the. Uh, sorry, I'm just laughing because I was thinking about how Bungie's evolved when you said that. Like, do you ever have the? Do you guys ever come to blows about what's going to be sacrificed? And I was just talking to uh, an engineer last week about um, how the language of sacrifice has evolved at Bungie. So 12, 12 or so years ago, it was like, listen, you're gonna have to, um, you have to pick a pick a baby. You have to shoot shoot a baby. And you're like, <laughs> like 12 years ago, you're like, oh, that's fine. And then it was like, okay, well now you've got to choose a puppy you're like okay and you're like no can we just have it be like a feature yeah like, just pick a feature that you would like to uh go forward with because you're like it just like just has changed right you're like i don't want to think about shooting puppies no one wants to think about shooting puppies. <laughs> no of course so, not so to so to get of to your question not. uh that that economy and the, the trade-offs is uh, is maybe the most contentious thing that we talk about because you know um as the game's footprint continues to grow you're like it cannot grow infinitely in a bunch of ways like i think right now I'm making these numbers up. This is totally fake. Uh, it's, but there are probably hundreds of thousands of words in the lore that is that are in the game right now. Like, that's a lot of words. Mm-hmm. Like, three years from now, is it going to be hundreds and thousands of words more, or are we going to like, you know, figure out like, are we going to have to think about something else? Are we going to have to like move things out or make more bucks or I, you know, I, I don't know, but, but that, that like simple thing about text, like about the like expanding footprint of text, uh, is nothing compared to the complexity of the expanding footprint of the game. And so we spend a lot of time and are spending a lot of time talking about this footprint, this ever growing footprint that we have with destiny two. And, you know, destiny two is a big ass download. I think we we did a thing this year to try to begin to reduce the size of the download, but if I do not recall if this is exactly how it works. At one point, though, and this may be what we're shipping, but at one point it was to shrink the disk size, you must re-download the disk size, and you're like, that, <laughs> that doesn't make how, sense. <laughs> how, that cannot be written about in a director's cut. I do not know how to explain that. <laughs> <laughs> it's 85 now. You have to re-download it, and it'll be 75. You're like, wait, what? <laughs> 
Uh, okay. So, so with that like the economy and that the, the trade offs that we have to make. This is a, a real problem for like a real a real problem for us and a, a, a major thing that we keep talking about. Is that something that you guys are actively working on with the ever forward march towards an all digital future? Is that something that you guys, as developers of a very large game that has this big digital footprint, are concerned for your player base on? Oh yeah, yeah we are we are concerned both for our player base and for our like development like our development team health and quality, like the, you know, making a build, how long does it take for a a designer and artist to make a change and for us to ship that change to a player? That like time is much longer than we want it to be. It's much longer than our players want it to be. And some of that's a function of that, like expanding complexity. And so it's all part of it. It's all part of this. Like, you know, when we talk about where we want to get destiny to and that like long vision that you keep stretching toward, it's all about, you know, a bunch of this is about how are we going to get to a, a place where, you know, the destiny that we know and love is going to continue to be around and be in our lives. I think it's interesting that you bring that up because I had a conversation with the Google Stadia team at PAX West about things like that. Obviously, you know, Destiny 2 is doing this big partnership with Stadia um, in November. And what they had said was a big feature set that developers are excited about is this idea that you don't have to push a patch to Stadia and have players download it when Bungie puts a patch in for Destiny 2. Stadia players don't have to download anything. It's just mm-hmm. automatically the there. Cloud, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah is, the that, computer. is that one of the reasons why you guys were excited about Stadia? Uh, I think that the technology is, is, is exciting, but I think a, a bunch of it too is it's, it like fits in that vision. Like that, like play at any time, anywhere with your friends. Like we wanted to do, we wanted to do cross save to get it so you like, you know, Greg could eventually, you know, come back, Greg. Go to we're PC. working on it. Not over. We're gonna do he can make his way to the, the personal computing platform if you want to. I'm not to. doing that. Uh, you know, a, a big PC player possibility over I'll there. I use the Stadia. All right, that the computers uh, in the cloud where it belongs. But, uh, I don't need it looking at me. In addition to like the like the the interest the interesting things that like cloud provides, it's also just about does this align with what we're trying to do with Destiny? And that like we're trying to look at a bunch of our decisions through through that lens. Like, is this right for for the vision for the game? I know every game director, creative director, someone who's overseeing a game, right? It becomes all encompassing of their lives. I I, I know that Brian Intahar guy, right? Like that's how it was for Spider-Man, right? My best friend, Brian Intahar. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) But when he crosses the finish line and ships the game, there's at least some downtime and then probably pre-production on something else and yada, yada, yada. Do you, do you feel like <laughs> destiny defines you? Is like that what you? Because like you can't do anything, right? Like you can't. Brian can tweet, and obviously he's going to get a, a Spider-Man question in there occasionally. You do anything, and it's got to just be about this game, right? Well, I think so. I think some of that's the you know prison that I've built for myself. Like, like, <laughs> I, like, like at, at, at some point, you, you know, uh, I th- there was some tweet, you know, last year uh, around an earnings call and mm. you know uh you know our our ex was you know there was a word that was used it was like disappointment or something like yeah, that and, and i thought uh, you know uh you know we had a res- you know a gentle response and i i thought that was the moment where it was like no longer my twitter account right like the like it's not like you don't really care what i have to say about end game do you you don't doesn't really matter you're here for like the one thing yeah. and so it is kind of like the, the like i've like built a prison around myself uh that prevents me from talking about a bunch of other stuff uh, i'm also afraid to so like if i'm like hey i just started i'm gonna have to pick a show i'm 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 not gonna oh i've watched it already so it's like but if i was like oh i've, I've never seen sopranos i'm just starting it out People are gonna ruin it for me. Yeah, Guaranteed. Like, it's gonna be ruined. So I'm like, I just, you know what? I'm ruining this for you like you ruined destiny. Yeah, exactly. No, like, really? Yeah, like, People are terrible. Yeah, and, and so you just, I was like, yeah, I'm just not gonna tell anyone what I'm doing. Like they're like, yeah, I'm just gonna like, yeah, I'll just use it this way. The the defining property of it is uh, is an interesting one. I, you know, I think that for a bunch of folks working on destiny, it's a game they've been working on for a long time. And so uh, I, I hope that, you know, I hope that for, you know, folks on the team, we're you're finding them. New fun stuff to work on uh, at at Bungie, and you know, uh, you know, but but for right now, you know, I'm okay. I'm okay with the I'm okay with the 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 black hooded sweatshirt of you know responsible for a bunch of destiny. You know, I'll, I'll wear that sweatshirt. You wear it with pride, for sure. Is it exhausting though? Um, like, do you have do you have time in brain capacity to think of other things, or is it literally like you're on the plane today and you're like, oh man, I really should figure out this for this this raid or whatever? Bro. Uh, no, I'm. I think I'm getting better at balancing my my brain. Yeah. Um. And uh, I still spend a lot of time thinking about destiny. 
it's still like the, you know, I don't know where people have most of their ideas. I think a lot of times it's like doing something downtime sure. where you're like, oh, I'm mowing the lawn or I'm like washing dishes or whatever. And that's when you have ideas. And a bunch of the ideas are still to me, destiny ideas, which says, I think it's a, it's a good place for me, uh, you know, as a, as a human. And I hope, you know, for a bunch of our, our team, it's still a, a good place for them too. In your director's cut, you mentioned specifically about the team being overworked and how some things you guys had to move around because you decided that the work-life balance at the studio was off. Is that something that, you know, universally people at the studio were like, yes, we need to do this? Or were some people having that creative push being like, I want to keep working? Because it's been an interesting thing that I've talked to several game developers about, and it seems like people are pretty split. Some game devs are like, I only want to work on this during regular normal hours. And others are like, I can't stop working. I just want to keep working all the time. And it's a really tough conversation, I think, for people on the outside, for consumers looking in to go to be able to balance that there's creatives that feel both ways. Yeah, it uh I, I've had a bunch of conversations with folks that I would describe as like earlier in career. Uh, and, and they're like, why are people telling me not to work? <laughs> <laughs> the, you know, I moved, I moved my apartment to be three blocks from Bungie when I was at the apex of like, I'm working hard. Cause I was like, I just want to be walking distance. I can always go in. I can always get stuff done. And I just, obs- I was obs- like, on, I, I, I was obsessed. Like I was the, one of those two types uh, of creative person. It was the, I just want to keep working on this thing. I love this thing. You know, I'm, I'm a, like when I was working on the raids, I was like, I, I believe I was put on the planet to do this. Like I had that kind of purpose in my head around, like you just couldn't pull me off. Of it. You just wild horses. Couldn't, couldn't drag me away from that. I think we have to figure out a way to accommodate both. And also like, I wasn't like living healthily. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like, I, mm-hmm. you know, I wasn't like, I was not taking good care of myself. I was, it actually is really good to get other stimulus into your, and, you know, other stimuli, I think, plural, like it's important to, to like be well-rounded um, as well. And that maybe that is not going to manifest for some folks until later on. You know, I'm, I'm experiencing a bunch of stuff that I think, you know, folks experience, you know, younger usually than, than where I'm at. Uh, but I, you know, I think those things are, are making me a more well-rounded person and are going to make me a, a better person to work, work with. Um, so it's, it's really, it's, there's no good answer to your question. Cause, cause <laughs> on, on one hand, you don't want to like, you don't want to, you don't want to like, pour water on someone's passion but on the other hand you also don't want that like passionate fire to be the thing that burns them out and well, so you, you got to figure out what that what that looks like i feel like when we talk about you know devs getting overworked right and all the systems that come with it and the problems that come with it one of them it seems to be and I, please correct me if i'm wrong because obviously you know better than me but optically from the outside it seems the difference of being forced to do it like there's a mandate from the company and, or putting it on yourself but then if you put it on yourself getting five years in and suddenly it's the thought process that it is the work making you do it. It isn't you doing it by choice anymore. I always talk about like when I started at IGN, right? Like I'd go to the bars with Damon and then I'd be like, all right, I'm going to go back to the office and capture WWE. And he's like, what the, why? Why? And I'm like, I just want to, I want to get all these wrestler entrances done. I'm excited to play the game. But it was like, that's a dumb thing to do. Why didn't I go home and sleep? (laughs) Yeah. Um, it's, yeah, I don't. I don't have any good answer other than the the like the passion flame equivalent. Yeah, like the yeah. because it's it's hard for it's hard to find the line uh, and the uh, even like the I think for us the company mandated you know with company mandated crunch or things like that like we really do try to avoid that. Of um, course, we are not as good at planning as we want to be, and I think we can always be better at it. But the uh, uh, you know it's also there's also value in like the 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 burst of hard work that finishes a thing. Sure. finishes a milestone or finishes an important deadline or finishes and gets the game to our players into our players hands and that like there's there can be a real unifying element to that as well and so uh, again it's like kind of based on your team your culture that you have at your studio and based on what you're doing for your game you know destiny is a game you said you, the opening of your question referencing brian was about like oh some downtime you're like and i laughed because uh, I was like, oh, some downtime. <laughs> what, you know? what is that? What is yeah, this yeah, downtime yeah. you speak of? You know, I, uh, I I slipped off after the director's cut for a week to rest, you know, on a beach somewhere in the world. And uh, then I'm back, right? Like, you're like, I'm gone for a week and I'm back because uh, we got more to do. And so I think figuring out, we, we talk about this a lot at, at, at Bungie, like, what's the, what's the rhythm we want to construct for a game that's always on like it's always yeah. there it's it's you know we want it to be a thing that you can come home to and you know like like a, a, the the bar that's always open but that doesn't serve alcoholic drinks right Cause, yeah because yeah. we have kids who play it's t14 yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. 
what do you think is the biggest thing gamers don't understand? Like, that's always the interesting line we walk with, like, Kind of Funny Games Daily or Gamescast, where we're talking about this, but I've never worked there. I don't know any of this stuff. So, uh, what is it? I'll, 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 I'll get to an answer, but I'm going to sure. ask back. Like, what is it that, that we want to understand about the way that entertainment's created? Like, do, do we really want to know what the Russo brothers went through to make Endgame? Mm. Or do we really want to know what, you know, Kevin Feige's, you know, work-life balance is like? Or do we want to just enjoy the cinema magic of it the, all the, enjoy the results because because mm, mm. sometimes if you know how the you know if you learn how the sausage is made you're like i don't think that i like this anymore but you're like no 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 like ex- ex- like experiencing the art for the sake of experiencing the art like that i guess my like question back is like how much do we how much do we as hu- you know as, as humans in this culture want to know about what goes into something I think we're just in this era of ever growing transparency and authenticity that really kind of kickstarted with the rise of, of vlogging on YouTube, right? This idea of like these people speaking directly to the their audience on the other side of the screen and how that's manifested over the last like decade and a half. And now people want to be involved in everything. They want to see all the behind the scenes. They want to see the Vidocs. You know, they they want to read the, the the manifesto that is the director's cut, right? Like they they can't soak up enough information about the thing that they love. But I don't think it's for everybody. I don't think it's for even the vast majority of consumers and players that are out there. I think most of them are very happy to just consume the final product and and never even know that you exist as a person, sadly. No, that's great. (laughs) I'm totally fine. That's that's awesome. I'm totally fine with that. Yeah. The, um, keep, 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 keep going. I like, I like, oh, yeah. I was just, I was just saying like this is, it's this idea that there is this community out there that can't get enough access that would love to come and tour the studio and see all the concept drawings and see every little thing that left the cutting room floor, you know, and like want to soak up all of that. But I think the vast majority of players are happy just to play a really kick ass game at the end of the day and have that experience that they can have either on their own or with their friends. And if they get to learn something about Bungie, I think they're like, cool, but um, I do think that there's always going to be that loud, small audience that is always like, "Give me more." So I don't know if that's ever going to go away. Oh, it's it's not a small audience with Destiny. Like we like like our fans will consume every piece of content we can create forever. They will always be faster than us. They will always like the first day. If there's some stat like the first day a Destiny release comes out and it's first like n hours there's already more playtime on the game than we've spent on it like Jeez. it's like the first day people have, are like no the community's already outplayed us like there are like, like they've, they've played it more than all of our testing combined all of our automated testing all of our human testing all of it like, you're like oh it's been uh it's not this but you're like oh it's been 20 minutes <laughs> <laughs> they've passed us and so uh so to, so to your back to your question though like the um how much how much access? What was the, give what, me, give what do gamers don't understand? Do you think, what, what do you think the number one thing they don't understand is about making a game being on your side of the so, industry? Uh, I think one of the things that they don't understand is the, 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 the confluence of difficult technologies yeah. that, that is the res, like that makes these things come together. Like, a you know, assembling a build like you would think just like I would think, you know, execute, press a button, like, <laughs> make, just make the fun build. Give me a fun build of the game. Where's the press the fun build button. Yeah. It's not press the fun build button at Bungie. It is, well, would you like a release or a profile build? Did you know what a release or a profile build was? I sure as hell didn't when I started. <laughs> uh, oh, cool. Of those, um, do you have a do you have a five-digit build number? Do you have a, a build number? What do you mean a build number? Well, no, it's like as it builds, we once it builds valid, we like get, it, it has a number on it. You're like, what? So if I'm just trying to play the game for fun at my desk, how, and this is like 2007, Luke is like, wait, so how the fuck do I look at Halo 3? I just want to play. And they're like, oh yeah, you need to get like, you need to prop a build, and you're like, I need a, I need a grown up. Right? <laughs> and so, so I, I think there's this, there's this. The, maybe it's like, hey, the, all, like a bunch of the stuff that you think would be really easy, and oh my gosh, bless other game developers. Like it might be there. Remember, I only know the one yeah, place. Yeah, right? yeah. Like I've just been with this in this one, twelve year long relationship, and so I don't know what. It, like it might totally be at Insomniac. Brian might have a fun button. <laughs> We don't. And so, <laughs> and, and so, and so that might be that might be that might be one of the things. Is is like a bunch of the things that sound easy are way harder. And goofily enough, some stuff that can sound really hard is sometimes way easier really? than, than you think. Yeah. Like what? 
Oh God, I I can't give you any example because if I give the wrong example, an engineer somebody who's yeah. gonna <laughs> and, and, someone and, who worked and, really hard and, be like, "Fuck you." An engineer will be like, "I can't believe you said that was easy," and yeah. you're like, "Oh God." And so, but the, like, you know, we could go for a hard example then, right? Well, making uh, so for instance, um, with the way that we hmm. <clears throat> building a, building a weapon, I think, is much harder than than people realize because of all of the the tuning variables that our weapon team puts into the game. Whether it's things like the effects, um, the audio, like that stuff's all kind of standard. But but each gun that that our team builds, like they they like hand tune each weapon, and so they're like playing with it, recoil angle, like they're like diffing it against other guns. Like, oh, have we made a hand cannon that feels this way before? You're like. No, you're like okay, cool. <laughs> right, but that, that's really hard because over time you're consuming all the space, and so you're like, well, what the hell? Just, why does Kindle Orchid feel exactly the same as, uh, you know, another 140 Ostringer? It does not feel exactly the same because that's what our team's trying to prevent. And mm-hmm. like looking at things through that lens uh, is is really complicated and really hard versus you know just stamping a bunch of guns out and putting perks on them and then doing custom art and things like that. So well, the guns are probably the most iconic part about the combat of destiny like it's like this identity right you get to see it front and center in the gameplay i talk about all the time how how unique the guns are in the game do you have like a favorite gun that you've worked on or that you like to play with um so i mm, you have I, to kill one of your babies it's always it's always it's always scary because the, the favorite question um so here here's my logic as i'm thinking about your question well i could I could tell people the truth and talk about what my favorite weapons are, but then they may believe that you we make changes better. to make them better or whatever because that's what I like the best. And so my next thought is... Well, what if we talk about like a D1 gun then? Well, but, my, but I'll just finish my thought and then I will give you okay. some semblance of an answer. Um, but my next thought is then like, what if I just lie? And I'm like, it's auto rifles. <laughs> <laughs> They're my favorite, <laughs> no. uh, which is, you know is, is not the case. So, uh, so my favorite weapon archetype stems all the way back to Halo One. You know, Halo One, the Halo One pistol, which I, I love the three shot kill. I thought it was awesome. Um, that was the the shooter that I cut a bunch of my teeth on, and so I think there's something really iconic and unique about running around in Destiny with a giant hand cannon. Um, the like I can I can look at a screen immediately and see if someone's carrying a big old hand cannon that I'm like that's destiny you know and so I think there's something there's something pretty cool about that the the fantasy of that like the lone gun person you know with yeah, the, yeah. the six to fourteen shooter you know in their in their in their one hand is is awesome and so you know I, for me emotionally I think the hand cannons have been have been a, have been a favorite of mine. Well, speaking of a favorite of mine, let's talk about the people who make this show happen, like everyone on patreon.com slash kind of funny, where you can get each and every episode of We Have Cool Friends ad free as well as today's sponsors. I'm starting with me undies. <laughs> What's that smell? Ah, yes, pumpkin spice. The leaves are crunchy. The breeze is crisp. It's officially onesie season. Hell yeah. And officially fall. Fall means back to school, back from vacay. Everything dies. It's sad. But fall is also the time to get soft. It's time to get cozy and it's time to cuddle up. Me undies are the softest undies in the world. And we know a little thing about that. Don't we, Luke Smith? We do. They're great. I'm wearing them now. I'm wearing mine right now, yeah. too. Yeah. Are yeah. you uh, Are you boxer briefs or what are you? What's boxer your? briefs, yeah. yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. You? I mix. Sometimes it's a box of oh. briefs. Sometimes it's just a raw boxer. I like the barn door. You like to keep me guessing. I yeah. appreciate it. I don't know what's going on down there. Uh, of course, me undies are the softest underwear around. Everybody knows that when we started using me undies around here, I threw away the rest of my underwear and ordered more me undies, which is a true story. And now I have a whole bunch of different onesies and pajama pants because they're super soft as well. And I appreciate that. Me undies just introduced five new silhouettes for the feel free collection for women designed with every body type in mind and a feather light waistband for you to feel free in. The exhaustion is gone now. New prints drop every Tuesday, so you'll never run out of ways to express yourself. Plus, members get an exclusive print at the beginning of every month. The prints are fun, and they also have classic colors, but don't always play by the rules. Me and he's just launched a white <gasps> after Labor Day. It's gone to their head. All right, I'll tell you what. Me Undies has a great deal for the listeners. Uh, any first-time purchasers get fifteen percent off and free shipping. This is a no-brainer, especially because they have a one hundred percent satisfaction guarantee. To get fifteen percent off your first pair and free shipping and a one hundred percent satisfaction go- guarantee, go to MeUndies.com/morning. That's MeUndies.com/morning. 
Up next, it's Zebit. No one likes zero of anything. Uh, like when your phone breaks and you lose contact with the outside world. Zero call, zero text, and zero social media. Honestly, life without a phone means pretty much zero everything. Having zero of anything is hardly ever a good thing, unless we're talking about Zebit. That Z-E-B-I-T. That'll change your whole perspective on zero forever, because you can go there and you get zero interest financing. You get all these different products there. You get them cheaper than you can get them elsewhere on the Zebit marketplace. Zebit provides a better credit option for those who need it. They allow you to buy what you need and pay over time interest-free. With Zebit, there's no cost to join, no memberships, and no late fees. Uh, Zebit does not check your credit score. It has zero impact on your credit score, and your Zebit account does not affect your credit score. Again, I think they're really stressing the credit score. It doesn't touch it. Don't worry, Luke. Uh, Zebit has everyday items at everyday prices. They have more than 50,000 products in their marketplace, uh, with brand names like Xbox, Sony, Apple, GoPro, and Fitbit. From electronics to barbecues, furniture, and more, Zebit has everything you need. It also has a five-star rating on Trustpilot. Sign up for Zebit today at zebit.com slash morning and get $2,500 credit in the shop. Uh, that's the Zebit marketplace, of course, with zero interest and zero cost to join. That's Z-E-B-I-T dot com slash morning for up to $2,500 of interest-free credit. Zebit.com slash morning. And finally, it's Upstart. As most of us know and have found out the hard way, getting into debt is easy. Getting out is hard, especially if your FICO score isn't great. Thankfully, now there's Upstart.com, the revolutionary lending platform that knows you're more than just your credit score and offers smarter interest rates to help you pay off high interest credit card debt. Very similar to you, Luke. When I moved to San Francisco, I made no money and took out a loan and it had a very bad rate and I don't, don't do that. Don't do that. Uh, do Upstart. It goes beyond the traditional FICO score when assessing your credit worthiness. Uh, it actually rewards you based on your education and job history in the form of a smarter interest rate. Upstart believes you're more than just your credit score. They believe in you and they understand that. Uh, they make it fast, simple, and easy to check your rate in just a few minutes without affecting your credit score. And the, once the loan is approved, most people get their funds the very next business day. Over 200,000 people have used Upstart to pay off credit card loans, student loans, and fund weddings, and make large purchases. So free yourself from the burden of high interest credit card debt by consolidating everything into one monthly payment with Upstart. See why Upstart is ranked number one in their category with over 300 businesses on Trustpilot. And hurry to upstart.com slash morning to find out how low your Upstart rate is. Checking your rate takes only a few minutes and it won't affect your credit. That's upstart.com slash morning. Morning, morning, morning. I feel if there's like an echo on it, it's cool. I was getting like, <laughs> I was getting real flashbacks to these like stress credit dreams that I have. Like the like credit score dream. I remember mm. like I used to get these all the time in my like, you know, or, like 20s. And I mean, I think in t like, I think even now still like, what's oh, you wake up and you're like, what's, no one else does this, right? What's like, my credit score? <laughs> what's my credit score? <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I had yesterday where I had an alert from the bank. I'm like, your credit score's moved. I was like, oh, God, like, what like, the hell happened? It, it, did it move in an acceptable direction or an unacceptable acceptable direction? Fine. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but it's just the thing, right? The moment, though, like, I still have bad dreams. I still have dreams about it. Or you wake up in the middle of the night. I'm like, <gasps> is it okay? You get off, run to the computer, <laughs> check it. You're fine. All right, it's time to enter the friend zone. This, of course, is where people over on patreon.com slash kind of funny have written in with questions for you, Luke. However, we're also adding the what's good friend zone over here, right, Andrea? Yeah, I've got a couple from the What's Good Guardians. Shout out to the Guardians. I'm wearing my 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 new What's Good Guardians volume two shirt that my friend Solid Snake Ocelot customized for me. As you can good see, day. it's all hunters. Shout out to all the hunters out there. That's me. <sighs> what? No, you're not a hunter. Well, I, actually, warlocks? true story. I play all of them. I well, play all one. Like a, like nope, a true I destiny play addict. Each one, yeah, pretty much equally. I monitor the playtime and it'll switch seasonally. Yeah, so. This is the reason I don't have the platinum. I couldn't. I couldn't go through the trees of all That's of them. That's why I'm a real Destiny player. I have the platinum. <laughs> no, but thank you, Barrett. <laughs> Thanks, Barrett. Whatever. You I, bet you don't, I bet you don't have your solstice gear. It's true. Uh, I don't. See, I've got the glowies, and you don't. Um, okay. This um, this is kind of a fun one um, from a, a gentleman on my clan named uh, Regiment Thirteen. He says, so we've heard the legendary story of Lenny James, the voice of Shax, and his incredible unreleased Shax spin on Shakespeare's but soft what light through yonder window breaks. But are there any favorite stories of your own connected to Destiny characters and the incredible talent that you've amassed over the years? P.S. Special shout out to Lance Reddick and his Destiny weekends on Twitter. Uh, that's too bad that his was a Lance shout out. Um, <laughs> the, uh, just because I so I did I went to Comic Con a few years ago. I don't I have no idea when this was. It was sometime in the last like three years and it was Lance and I doing a thing together. Like we, I was hosting some panel and then Lance and I were, and some other folks were doing a signing and he was like, just, he's just the most pleasant man. He's so awesome. Uh, and the, you know, I remember the first time meeting him and it was like, Oh, it's, 
Lieutenant Daniels from The Wire. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cool. And uh, and then uh, it was when he told me he's like since he's like since put all this on the internet. But it was like that he's a warlock player, not a titan player. That that was that you know that's like probably one of the, the cooler moments. Yeah. Um. For at least for, uh, the of meeting the 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 voice talent. Um. Andrew Rowe wrote into the friend zone on Patreon and said, uh, "What would you say is the unique thing that makes you smile when you are at work?" Which I thought was a lovely question. <laughs> it, like the, yeah, you're, it's it, it's it's a lovely earnest question. So you don't want to give like the eh, like the infinite Coke Zero is nice, you yeah. know. Uh, Man, you really like Coke Zero, huh? I I do. Yeah, I'm I'm trying to get a sponsorship. Gotcha. <laughs> we call them CZs around here. Oh really? Yeah, or you either get a DC or a CZ. Wow. I think I got a H two O, but that's what everybody else around here says. Wow, is that is that because it's like you have to hide the labels or? No, it's because Nick's weird. Okay. And Nick wants to <laughs> seem like he's young, but he's really old. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, I've been I've been told uh, officially that I'm not allowed to use the word lit. Oh, like no, it's just a, yeah, no. it's it's a, not for mm. people of my my generation. In a text or a Slack the other day, Barrett used Liddy, and I had to text another person <laughs> to see if he was fucking with me. <laughs> yeah. Is that a real thing? Is no, that it's real not thing? real. It, it is. Oh, it what? Is. Yeah. Oh, it was I, me and Roger McCorney both texted Greg yeah. at separate times in the same day. Liddy. Well, Roger's the one I reached out to. I'm like, yeah. you t- you tell me straight. It's like Stan. I don't understand this thing with Stan <laughs> either. Stan I remember the Stan music though. video. I know, I know, but like using it in a different way, um, right? Like you're obsessed. People, like you stand destiny for sure. Yeah. Well, of course, yeah. But I, I've never actually used it in a sentence, sure. or I on a tweet did. or anything. No, yeah, I don't. I, I would have to be educated on the standing of okay. things. Uh, so something that makes me smile every day when I come to work. Um, I, th- I think uh, it's like uh, the concept art team. Truly, like yeah. the like. I, I saw a thing this last week. Um, that my uh, Mike Zach, who's our art director, and I talked about probably like two months ago. I was like, "Hey, here's this idea for a thing. It'd be cool, a way to promote a thing." And blah. blah. And he's like, "Okay, well, let me take it to the concept artist." And then uh, one of our concept artists was like, "Ah, oh, it sounds really cool." And then they, the concept artists are like, uh, the way I've described it to Mike is they're like the Omega level mutants of creatives because they are like wholly able to close their eyes and where us normal humans just see like the back of our eyelids. They're like. A world and you're like oh, okay cool and you're like oh you can kind of be imaginative and i can like oh, i can see a cool world but can i draw it no <laughs> <laughs> I can't. so there are these like so the the concept team so so when i get to see stuff from our concept team it's just incredible joy every time because even whether it's like right or you're like eh, i wish it was different or whatever so you're just like this is just someone who's you know infinite infinite levels of talent and uh, they have the ability, you know, to when yeah, when normal people close their eyes, they see their eyelids, and they see something that they can then put put on a piece of you know paper or yeah. you know, digital paper or whatever. It's you know, just like this is amazing. That's so, awesome. The concept team, concept art. Got it. Yeah, concept art. Got it. Nice. Oh, okay, I've got another one from Endorphins. You've referenced your love for World of Warcraft and how you want Destiny to embrace its yes. MMO RPG <laughs> aspects. One of the only games that competes for my time like Destiny is Diablo 3. Have you looked at what Josh Moscarita and the team did with Reaper of Souls expansions, Loot 2.0, Seasons, and the continually improving endgame of Diablo 3? Yeah, the uh, we actually, fun fact, so Josh used to work with Noseworthy mm. long ago. And so many years ago, we actually we actually brought up a bunch of the folks from Diablo. Uh, when I don't I don't recall exactly when it was, but we brought a bunch of them up to the studio, and we we talked about uh, about stuff with those folks. I think Diablo and Destiny have like different goals uh, as 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 games. They uh, they both strive to create community communities. I think in slightly different ways. Um, our our philosophy around community creation is about uh, constructing mountains and building mountain climbers out of our players. Um, and I think Diablo has a different philosophy there where uh, I'm not going to try to uh, say what I think their philosophy is, but ours is really about creating cool challenges that we put in front of players that they get to go up, summit these awesome challenges, come down to the mountain, come down from the mountain. And then people are like, ooh, you've been climbing. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to go with you. And so uh, that is that's kind of how we think about it. Uh, there's a bunch of there's a bunch of cool stuff that games like Diablo do. Uh, we've, we've, we've looked at a, b- a bunch of those things. Uh, in our in our in our many years on Destiny, okay, it's a good question. Good job, Guardians. <laughs> Colton writes in to patreoncom slash and says, "What is your lowest moment and your most proud moment of your Destiny career?" Thanks for the transparency, love, and respect, Hart. Um, I think the the proudest moment of my career, although I like genuinely hate that word, I hate the word proud. Um, oh, don't be ashamed of it. Why? Well, I, I, it's it's just like the I think if you tell someone you're proud of them. 
Uh, it is. It sounds a, like you're their dad. It's implying a state that I don't think is ex, is, is appropriate. Um, so a thing that I a thing that the the, the teams created that uh, I look at really fondly, I think would probably be you know just like you know from a. Uh, I, I think the first uh, the first raid that we released mm, was was mm. was pretty cool. I actually uh, I didn't get to see any of it get played. Um, that uh, whenever that was, it was like a week after launch. So it's like next week or something. My father actually had a heart attack. Oh wow! Uh, the day before the raid launched, and so I was back in Michigan. He's fi- he's like totally fine. Okay, good. Um, but like I didn't get to experience any of it, and I don't know what happened at the studio that day. But I remember logging in the night that it came out, and people were still raiding and like tuning in on some 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 random Twitch stream, like just like random. And a group was talking about their, they said something like, "This is like this is like a was like a World of Warcraft raid in a shooter." And I was like, <laughs> "It is, it really is." You know? And, and uh, so I I think for me, you know, when I think about that that purpose and you know feeling like you're put on the earth to do a thing. Uh, that was a moment that I'm I'm pretty uh, happy with when I look at my career. I think the lowest period is um, is for sure uh, you know outside of the six week honeymoon with D two and that that period for me lasted for about a year I think of you know uh, looking at the game and what was happening with it and you know uh, we were work, Mark and I were working on some different stuff um, at that point and and you know not. Um, feeling like your work is unfinished mm-hmm. is a really bad feeling. Sure. And so I would say, you know, that period after the game came out and we really felt like our work was unfinished uh, was a was a low point. And I think if there's if there's anything that people have taken away from from that period and the way that you know we turn things around with Forsaken, the way that we've kind of gathered you know gathered ourselves up this year going forward, it's it's to you know it's to finish what we started. You know, the like. And the like the the metaphorical never again tattoo, <laughs> uh, um, you know, Mark and Mark and I and a bunch of folks from the team have on us to to not to not set set the the game adrift like that again. But that was the that period about a year plus. I think if you ask my wife, she would say that was the lowest period. I mean, that was a you know come home you know beaten. C- yeah, come home immediately, lock self in office, mm. and mm. you know re- emerge from office to go to bed. It was a pretty shitty time. And, you know, people have shitty times like that in their lives. I'm not special in any way, shape, or form. And it comes for many different reasons. And it's even a little whiny for me to say it was about making a video game. Because at the end of the day, I I still get to make a video game. And so that's a pretty fucking awesome thing. How did you find yourself? Was it just doing the work that pulled you out of it? The shitty time? I think it was a mix. It was a mix of, like, doing the, starting to get back in to do the work. But also, like, get some get some perspective. Like, you know, I I talked, we talked, like, in, in the first 20 minutes our inability to celebrate at Bungie, right? Like we're not very good at this. We're not very good at like recognizing that, you know, the stuff we make is cool and it's unique and we don't do a lot of back padding. And so you get, you get far enough away from something. You can get a little bit of perspective. There's a designer on the team to give you a totally counter example who said after Tank King came out, I looked like just a, a piece of like human garbage, like wilting through the world. You know, I just was, he said, you just looked super unhappy. And I was like, really? I think I might have just been really tired, but like a year later or whatever. <laughs> I thought it looked great. A year <laughs> later, uh, you know, a year after taking care or whatever, you're like, oh, that was pretty good. I think there's just some of it's just this. There can be this like malaise when it's all over. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, uh, but but I think you know, getting getting back to it, thinking really getting that purpose for ourselves and for the company. I think for me personally, it was oh, it's like it feels so self indulgent to talk about myself. Uh, it was really thinking about why, like, what's the, what's the thing I want to create? Like, what is the thing for me that's motivating? And it's, it's about building machines that create memories. And if you think about memories at this like fundamental level, um, they're almost always accompanied by a person who is there. Like, I do not remember when I beat Super Mario Brothers three. I don't remember anything. I couldn't tell you what the final boss is, but I know my dad watched me do it because I have a picture. Right. Uh, and so it's about building the memory machine and the memories are uh, the, the other people are like the glue that anchor the memory together. And I think about that from the perspective of like, well, why would I do anything then? And it's, oh, that's what I would want to do. I'd want to build things that have human beings create memories together. And then you think about, well, where would I do that? Well, I already get to do it in a pretty cool place with like a bunch of super talented geniuses. And uh, we get to work on a game that. I really think there's nothing like it. 
And so that seems like a pretty good spot to get yourself back out onto the field and, you know, get back Hell out yeah. there again. So that was kind of the highs, the lows and how you, how you get back. It's a good question. Good Pe- job, Colton. People ask me all the time, like why I keep coming back to destiny and why I continue to play month after month. And it's always revolves for me around the relationships that I have around destiny and the people that I get to play with. So I want to hear about your crew. Who are, who are like your destiny standbys? <laughs> who do you play with all the time? Who's like, when you boot up the game, they're, they're in your roster all the time that you're like, I know I can count on that person to hit the nightfall with me to like run the raid for gear. Like who, who's your crew? So, uh, <laughs> Uh, I don't play with people I work with, first of all, because I can be uh, a bit of a jerk when I'm playing video <laughs> games. I can be a bit, I can, there's a little bit of raid nerd raging that happens. Which don't you, look at me. Which <laughs> you can't see me like this. I'm in a position which, of power. Which you, would, which, you wouldn't, which you wouldn't think, being that I should know how they work, but I oftentimes will like, I'll try, if like the raid team does such a good job that like a bunch of the raids can come out and I'm like, I'm like not play tested them internally. Cause like they're just doing their thing. They're awesome at it. And then I get like the fun of the surprise, but then my friends who also don't know, we all get the, the fun of like the nerd raging together about it. And so two of what those the fuck does want me to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can't believe we're not communicating this mechanic better, <laughs> you know, like the, you know, uh, but like, you know, probably uh, more less T for teen rated version. Yeah. of that. And so, uh, there have been a couple of folks who, uh, I've played destiny with for years. And one of them is a guy I've played with since, I mean, we've been playing games together since 2004. Like we've been, been, and that's a guy named uh, his his uh, his, uh, his his name's Ram, uh, not his real name. And then the uh, and so we've just been playing all along. And he actually drifts in and out of Destiny t- as well. So he'll he's a guy who if there's an event in the game, like if we put, if we put any event in the game, he's playing. Like he doesn't matter. We're like, yeah, you can come back for a name plate. He's like, oh, we're doing it. You know, he's just he's like in. He loves events, right? And then the other guy is this guy Havoc, and uh, Havoc and I have been playing Destiny together for since Vault of Glass. And he was a guy we met from a message board that a bunch of folks posted on, and we sort of grabbed him and brought him into the group. And um, he's uh, he's been he's been awesome. And so he actually is the person I probably play games with the most. Uh, and we'll play. Oh, we'll just play all kinds of bullshit. Like we'll play Destiny. If, I mean, I'm sure he's going to be trying to get me to play Gears or some something like that. Some other games that come out. You know, we usually we'll jump back and forth between games. And so those two are there. Uh, a couple of my friends from growing up that we used to play Halo with, a guy Tom and Jeff, will still play together. I use their real names. Um, <laughs> uh, and so I have like my own little my own little crew. Um, you know, we've added my wife to it over the years, and uh, you know she. Uh, you know, she, she is less tolerant of uh, my bullshit, I think, than uh, <laughs> uh, than they are. I think I think one thing that was said to me at some point in the not too distant past was, "You can't talk to me like that. I'm special." <laughs> 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 you know, you're like, "Oh shit, okay, yeah, like, uh, maybe I should chill in this scourge of the past raid, everyone." <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> That's awesome. That's fantastic. Do you have any audience questions? Um, yes. So uh, Whiskey Jack wants to know, Shadow Keep will bring us Armor 2.0, which will help players customize their gear to their liking. Is there any chance we'll get a Weapons 2.0 system in the future? So uh, we're looking at weapons overall right now. Um, there was a, there's a long, long, um, you know, it's like probably 2,000 words deleted scene from the director's cut. That's really looking at things like infusion and weapons and the relationships that we we, we want players to, you know, think of their weapons uh, in Destiny with. We're not working on a weapons 2.0 right now. That's uh, it's the type of thing where like we could we could bet on that right now, but like what we really are looking at is how are we going to continue to grow build crafting, and that's kind of like the next big uh, that's like the frontier that we're exploring right now and. I could imagine at some point taking a look at weapons down the road, uh, but that's I think that's that's pretty far pretty far down the road. I think there's some stuff that we're going to continue to improve about weapons. Like I've been seeing a bunch of you know chatter and sentiment around like we want you know certain certain weapons from certain activities to feel more special. I think there's I think there's good good feedback that I've been seeing there, but but there's not an active like let's overhaul weapons. Like nope, those are those are good. Let's <laughs> let's let's figure out what the behavior we want players to to have like the emotion we want them to feel with their items and uh and figure out what the right thing to do with weapons is once we have that answer 
Final question from the friend zone comes from Scott Butterworth, who wrote into patreon.com slash kind of funny and says, Luke, the community really appreciated the director's cut and the clear communication about choices and the reasons behind them. I've been playing D2 on and off since launch. I love where the game is at and where it's heading. My question is, how does it feel for you and the entire team to have the community back in your corner? Uh, there's so like the there's the one part of the answer which it feels awesome. Of course. But there's this other thing, and maybe this is a, a very human flaw of mine, which is I try not to get too, like, the naive belief, as I just told you about, like, a year of solace, basically. Um, the naive belief that I have is if you don't get too high on your own supply from, if you don't, don't like, ride the good vibes train, then you can stay off of the, like, it's going to go bad. Yeah, yep. That's the, like, I think that's not, I think, I think my belief is naive because, uh, you know, I think I insulate myself pretty well from the positive stuff. Like, I'm just a, you know, I think Obi-Wan Kenobi in the prequel says I'm just a simple man trying to make my way in the universe. Uh, that is how I feel about things. But uh, the it's hard to avoid the negative stuff. So for the team at the team at large, there's a real difference in the energy that you feel at the studio when the team when when the community is excited and when we've had different events like Whisper of the Worm and Zero Hour raid launches, all kinds of awesome moments like that. You really feel the like the the community really energizes the studio, and for that energy, uh, and the, the, uh, it's, I'm grateful for that uh, for our team. Um, and so, if it, it feels good, but you also you know it's it, you know it's not always going to be that way. Like yeah, you can't let go to your head. It's gonna, right? Yeah, it's gonna it's gonna go up and down. It's just the nature of these these things. And so, if it, if you're like ah, you know I love the good feelings, then you're like opening yourself up. If you're being honest with yourself about. Well, I got to take all the negatives as as like lovingly as I take those, and that second thing's hard. Oh, and yeah. we're like n- nerdy game developers; we're not trained to like we're not trained to deal with that. So, for for each human, I recommend they just figure out what's what's best for them. Um, for me, it's to try to not really focus too much on the positives. Um, really continue to think about what's the what's the way forward for Destiny. How are we getting closer to where we wanted to go? And and you know when the when the when the waters get choppy again, you know, hope that you've got the right boat. Luke, thank you for being one of our cool friends. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. No problem. Anytime. And maybe it won't take us, you know, four years to do it again next time. Or whatever. <laughs> yeah. I still have so many more questions. <laughs> Lay one on them. Go ahead. You can go. Oh, no, no, no. He had such a, a, a fantastic button there. We can't. Perfect. can't stop on that no uh, of course ladies and gentlemen this is we have cool friends uh you can find luke on the internet where he only talks about destiny to keep you happy so just do that pick up destiny <laughs> <laughs> i just want to talk about sports and movies <laughs> no yeah. get a burner account nobody cares yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> thanks again for coming through yeah destiny 2 out now of course fifth year you got a whole bunch of different stuff coming up yeah shadow keep october 1st yeah i think yeah oh she's right there she, she's nodding her head yeah vanessa saying yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Ah, uh, yeah, there's a bunch of stuff. Read the director's cut, cool 30,000 yeah. words. Have fun. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this, of course, has been We Have Cool Friends. Each and every Monday, we sit down with our cool friends, talk about the cool stuff they're doing. Uh, it's interesting. If you're watching uh, right now and you want to submit questions, you can go to patreon.com slash kindoffunny. You can submit questions for one, Andrea Renee, recording a We Have Cool Friends before she jets for LA and is a traitor officially. <laughs> and, of course, then next Monday, it'll be uh, Mega Ran in town. So I'm not sure how we're airing the episodes, but those are the next two guests. Get questions in for all of them. Remember, it would help us out a lot if you went to the podcast services, subscribed, liked, left reviews. We're still a brand new show. If if you're already listening to us on an mp3 i don't need to look at the camera i can turn around but i'd ask you to go to youtube.com slash kind of funny and subscribe there like the video there you know my like i don't watch youtube but you have a google account it would just help us out if you subscribe it's just pretty simple it helps us out quite a bit uh and until next time no it's been our pleasure to serve you